All right, welcome everybody. Hope that things are going well for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about some amazing stuff that has been going on this week with uh, the bad boy of science, the bubble of the bad boy of science. <laughs> yeah, so like I said to you, it's, it seems like it's been a very uh, hectic week in science. We had the LHCB results sort of seems an age ago now. What about a week ago, week and a half ago? And uh, looked like there might be some uh, breakdown in lepton universality, but it was only a three sigma. So, you know, most particle physicists don't get out of bed for three sigma. Yeah. And then yesterday we had the uh, the G minus two results at 4.2 sigma. So a little bit more powerful, suggesting uh, another deviation from the, the standard model. So lots going on in, you know, the world of particle physics. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's uh, let's split our time uh, between the two so sure. that we can uh, let's start with the LHCB results so that we can um, well so I can get some better idea of what's going on uh, with LHCB so it's not the most famous of all of the um, detectors at the Large Hadron Collider so <laughs> no but this is my experiment Jason I know Come but on, <laughs> but it, sometimes obscurity is better right um, it right. allows you I'll to take, I'll, ta I'll take the backhanded comp compliment we'll, no we'll like, go with that. like I have a uh, Oh, I I know I'm from a town when I was young I was from a town that has like a thousand people in it so um, I, I take great pleasure in being from a place that no one that people <laughs> don't hear about that much no it's um, no you're right you're right it's no atlas it's no CMS it's not one of the Higgs finding experiments um, it's one of the smaller less well-known experiments on the ring at the LHC at CERN that's right yeah so typically when people look at the Large Hadron Collider um, they, the things that you see most often, the images that are displayed most often of the detectors are of the ATLAS and CMS detectors. And so those are the big, uh, the big detectors. LHCB is one of the two smaller detectors. Is What's the last one? ALICE? Is that what it's called? ALICE, yeah. ALICE is on the other side of the ring. So people who used to work on ALICE, the poor guys, they... Um, That's like an Atlas hour drive, is, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So ATLAS is... Uh, right separate uh, you know sat right there on the CERN gate basically and then Alice is obviously across the other side of this 27 kilometer circumference ring so they'd have to uh, drive all the way across the diameter you know worse than the diameter because you can't obviously go as the crow flies so the worst place to be was uh, was Alice right across the uh, right across the ring we were at um, I don't know which point is it now so it, it was set out in eights and I think we were at something like point three uh -huh. So it wasn't too bad. We were sort of round, not quite 90 degrees round the circle. So it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. um, but you were working at Atlas was definitely the easiest one. You just wandered across the road from the office and and you were there. And uh, as I say, Alice, get in your car because otherwise you're not getting there. Yeah, no kidding. So, um, all right. So LHCB, why don't you? What is the what is the detector like, and how is the detector different from? Um, the atlas and cms detectors yeah so lacb is essentially a detector that looks at beauty and charm quarks and the decays thereof looking at things like matter antimatter asymmetries in terms of the setup it's a little bit different from atlas and cms which are kind of barrel detectors that sit around the beam pipe in a sort of cylindrical um setup and then obviously the particles smash together and the, the particles stream out into that cylinder LHCB is set up more like a wedge, um, so we only get particle collisions firing in one way, very close to the the beam angle. Um, okay, so you're so, not uh, LHCB is not um, a head-on collision; it's a fixed target experiment. No, no, it's it's, it's on the ring, so it's, oh, it's still on the a ring. collision okay. experiment. But we essentially lose half of it, half of the collisions, because half of it goes away from the experiment. So you can imagine Atlas is wrapped around the beam pipe, uh -huh. so it picks up all of the collision stuff. Whereas LHCB is like a, a sort of wedge, like a door wedge shape. So the particles come in and smash together. Half uh -huh. of the collision stuff goes this way, half goes this way, and we only pick half of it up. Um, so okay. just just for, for cost sake. Oh, so really. now are you picking up stuff that's perpendicular to the beam line? Uh, well, we can pick up some stuff that's perpendicular to the beam line, but mostly stuff that's very close to the beam line. Okay. Um, so, so very sort of highly scattered forward. Um, one of the things it looks at 
very much is the decay of of B quarks or um, you know hadrons that contain B quarks. And this is what it was looking at last week, or the results that came out last week. So we're looking at the decays of uh, B plus um, of B plus, mm -hmm. and they were decaying to essentially kaons and either a pair of muons or a pair of electrons. And the standard model tells us that due to lepton universality, the decay rates to um, to different types of leptons, so pairs of electrons or pairs of muons, for B quark should be the same. Mm -hmm. And what LHCB saw was that it seems like nature is favoring B quarks decaying to muons instead of electrons. And that's not something you would expect. You'd accept the rates to be the same. Obviously now, after is the, are the rates the same the be because the B quark is so much heavier than the muon and the electron? I guess so. So you'd have to collect, you'd have to, um, you have to correct for kinematic effects, right? Because there's more phase space for the decays to electrons, I guess, because the electrons are lower mass. So you have to do some corrections, but in terms of the forces involved, in terms of the mechanics involved in the interaction, they should be exactly the same mm -hmm. because you've got this coupling of a W to, you know, an E plus E minus or a, a mu plus mu minus. Okay. So now the rate the... of these decays, the number of them you see should be the same. Okay. So you have the, um, the B quarks coming in. Uh, does that mean that in order to produce the B quarks? Now, uh, here's a, a quick question. Do people Good. still call it beauty or did they stop calling it beauty in the 1970s? <laughs> I, do you know what? I think most people I know call it beauty because they they find it a bit childish and stuff to call it bottom uh -huh. but you know a bottom can be beautiful i guess okay well, definitely can all right so so, so the british beauty, so the people people in the uh, people in the uk and in at cern have their minds in the gutter and people <laughs> in the because i've always learned at the bottom court because like top and bottom um yeah. up down stomp charm strange top and bottom makes People would say it like that. I, I find most people say beauty. Maybe okay. it's because it goes with the charm as well. So I, I can say, you know, I studied charm and beauty at the LHCB uh -huh. experiment. It sounds okay. quite... So, because I always was know, like... Grandiose. The, the way that I learned it was that they were going to call it beauty, but they got sick of strange and charm as these things. And they were like, okay, we're not... The 1970s are over, hippies are out, and you know now <laughs> we're getting into new wave and rockers. Um as the you know in excess is is all the rage and tears for fears and so we're going to just call them bottom and top so i guess L large hadron collider beauty experiment sounds like sounds better than lhcb bottom experiment large uh -huh. hadron collider bottom experiment. yeah like why are you makes the it bottom? sound like it's the worst the lesser one so all right maybe so that's why they uh, interesting cultural note because i didn't i i had never heard it referred to seriously as the beauty quark until uh until uh, i guess today um yeah. So, um, all right. Well, so that's... anyone who's listening can substitute beauty for bottom. Uh huh. You know, in right. most contexts. Now, fine. does the does the LHC have to operate in a particular phase or in a particular mode for your experiment to operate, or do they just run it at whatever full? No, full so powers? they just so they just run the beam as normal, and there's various points where the beams are brought into collision. So what they what they have <clears throat> from my you know, understanding of the operation of the machine itself is you have the obviously the circulating beams of protons, one clockwise, one anti-clockwise, counterclockwise, and then at various points around the ring, these eight points. So Atlas is at point one, Alice is across the ring at like you know another point, and uh, at these various points they have kicker magnets which bring the two anti-parallel beams into collision. So they essentially kick. The protons into collision mm -hmm. in the the hearts of the experiment. So, LHCb like Atlas, like CMS, just requires those beams to be circulating, and obviously the patterns are set up in such a way that most of the bunches cross at the experiment, mm -hmm. but then they're kicked into collision by little kicker magnets near the experiments to to actually get the collisions in the hearts of the various detectors. So. There's there's no real special mode for LHCB. LHCB can be running while Atlas is running, while CMS is running. Okay. There's not a there's not a dedicated run for each particular experiment. Okay. And uh, so was it is this a single measurement? Is it 
just designed for this one specific measurement, or are there other measurements that you do at LHCB besides? So, because it's basically looking at bottom cork decays or beauty decays, right? Mm -hmm. So a hell, of, a hell of a lot of decays, lots of different um, decay modes for a start. So, so for example, my decay mode that I was looking at was was the decay of um, D plus measles, right? So lots of different decays in bottom and charm. Mm -hmm. Charm decays tend to be more frequent but have smaller CP violation effects in them, whereas B quarks are produced less frequently but have larger amounts of CP violation in them, general, mm -hmm. general case. So we look at the decays of lots of different types of particles and try to look for those CP violation effects. CP violation for anyone watching is any difference in the decay rates between a particle and its antiparticle. So a D meson and an anti D meson, for example, mm -hmm. looking at differences in, the, in their decay rates. And there's thousands of analyses, loads of different particles. Um, another uh, analysis that came out recently was looking for exotic states of matter. So LHCB found the first um, pentaquark, for example. Uh -huh. um, you know, when I was at university, it was always everything's either mesons or baryons. And then suddenly we got this packaging in, in pentaquarks at LHCB, uh -huh. which makes things all a little bit more complicated. Yeah, so generally um, particles like meson particles, like middle sized particles are a quark anti quark pair. And yeah. bar baryons, which is everybody else, is a three quark set, three quarks, uh, a three quark yeah. ensemble of Correct. all either matter or, if it's an antibaryon, all antimatter, as opposed to a particle antiparticle or a quark antiquark pair. And a pentaquark is kind of both of them together. Yeah, um, and I actually found you could have a essentially a bunch of five of them together, mm -hmm. which makes things a little bit more more complicated. Yeah, so you'll have um, one antiquark and then four quarks. Um, for the for the uh, pentaquark, or do you have a or do you have a quark antiquark pair and then three? I'll have to check, but you can have essentially have a have a box of five, which which people had thought wasn't possible. Everything that had been found before LHCb was either a, a hadron or a meson, as you so as you to said. establish a pentaquark. Does that mean that what you have to do is you have to demonstrate that it stays as an ensemble until it travels some distance before it decays? I guess so. I would have to have a look at, back at the specific measurement. I haven't looked at it for a long time. Um, but I guess so, right? Because anything needs to have a significant lifetime to be able to be claimed as a said particle. to have existed <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, and be named as a particle. Now, I, I believe that that length of time is fairly arbitrary. It seems to get yeah. shorter and shorter as we're able to measure shorter and shorter. So maybe we're just manufacturing particles out of nowhere. But uh, I would have to check exactly, but presumably there's some there's some minimum arbitrary limit that they've set on time. Otherwise, it makes no sense because the thing has to exist for a certain set amount of time. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, LHCB, you were looking specifically. Um, now, why is it? Do you know why it is that the bottom cork and the charm cork don't have the same? Like, why does one have a stronger CP violation than the other? Now, the CP violation just in general is important because if there weren't CP violation, then we wouldn't be here. Um, CP violation is presumed to be what allowed the asymmetry in the production of particles and antiparticles in the early universe, and as a consequence, allowed there to be an excess of matter um, as opposed to an equal amount of matter and antimatter. Um, and that small excess of a part per billion is what eventually allowed stars to form and things like that. Otherwise, all the matter, the universe would be just filled with photons. Um, and so finding sources of CP violation is kind of a big question in physics because it gets to the heart of why do we exist in the first place? Exactly. So it was a really nice thing, a really nice thing to study and say, look, I'm looking for the origins of the universe. Why are we even here? Didn't, didn't find anything in the end, in the PhD, but, you know, it was a nice little tagline to put with the with the experiment in terms of why are there different amounts of CP violation in terms of the standard model in different sectors for the for the bottom and and for the charm you have to go back to the the CKM matrix so it's a long time since I did this this theory sided stuff in my uh, in my dissertation I guess last uh, last when I looked at it but if you go to the the CKM matrix you might be able to bring it up uh, Kobayashi uh, someone and Maskawa matrix. I forget the uh -huh. K. So there's a great figure that they usually put in the, yeah. Okay. I'm going to steal whoever person this is. I think this is right. 
So um, CKM is is it Kabibo Kobayashi Muskawa, I think. If you can. I don't so know the P, the there, particle data group has basically how the quarks uh, mix with each other. Yeah. Um, the matrix itself is just you know a set of nine numbers, but a, a set of nine numbers. Yeah. But the <clears throat> the contributions in that matrix, which are determined, a lot of them just simply from experiment, um, essentially determine the amount of CP violation we're seeing in those sectors. Um, but it's difficult to know them from first principles, some of them. So it's still an open question, really, as mm -hmm. far as I'm aware. So the Kabibo angle, uh, is that, so the that's not the same thing as, that's not the same thing as the, or is it the same thing as the weak mixing angle? Yes. Uh, well, no. No, that's a... But, but it's, what what it is, is it, it accounts for the, um, well, it depends. Some, some people call these things different things, but it, it Oh, it's the, the mixing of the down quark and the strange quark. Is what exactly. It, is. it controls the uh, cross-generational um, interaction of quarks in, in various decays. So, okay, so, what, a... so let's see. So what's going to happen is that you're going to produce particles in a pure state of some sort. And then yeah. they, they propagate. Uh, well, the they mathematics of the propagation a... is in a slightly different state. It's a superposition of the state. That's right. They, and they then interact can... as a superposition of those. Uh -huh. of, as, of those states. And so, the amount that they overlap tells you the rel when you actually make the detection tells you the relative probability of seeing one type or the other. Exactly. So if you if you couple within the same generation, you'll get a factor of cos theta, mm -hmm. where theta is some small angle, so it's close to what. Mm -hmm. But if you couple across a generation, so let's say up to strange, then you'll get a factor of sine theta, which is obviously close to, zero. close to zero close to zero so we call it kabibo favored or kabibo suppressed if you're kabibo favored the interaction is more likely to happen and if you're kabibo suppressed obviously it's less likely to happen mm -hmm. and in any interaction you obviously have to square that because you're taking the square of the interaction the square of the matrix element so it becomes sine squared or cos squared so you can get very strong suppression of certain interactions and very strong mm -hmm. sort of um, uh, propagation of certain uh, interactions because of that value of the Kabibo angle. And the CKM matrix is essentially extending the idea of the Kabibo angle out across all three of the all uh, generations. So you're going to have three what three, three mixing angles and, uh, and a phase. There's like three in a phase. Yeah. I, I, I forget my uh, matrix algebra, but I think it's three in a phase. Is the is like the minimum you can break it down to this Wolfenstein parameterization. It's okay, so like a long time since. So I have this uh, I have this thing pulled up mind. that has. So you've got three different components. Uh, they mix different. So two, three, one, three, and one, two, and then yep. the phase is this delta quantity. Yeah. And delta. So this is so the CKM matrix is for the strong nuclear force. So delta is the secret source where the CP violation starts starts turning up. Okay, and then there's the equivalent of the CKM matrix that's the matrix for the weak particle. So that'll be the, the, the leptons. The PMNS, the... PMNS matrix? Yeah, well, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's some... Um, but it also has basically three mixing angles and a CP violating phase. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the okay, so keep going with uh, you're measure, we're measuring the CP violating phase because the more CP violation um, that we discover, the more we can rest assured that we are actually here to begin with, that there is matter in the universe and that we're made out of it. That's right. The prob the problem is within the uh, standard model. Even if we were to find all of the CP violation that's allowed within the standard model, it still wouldn't be enough to account for why we're here. So a lot of the things we were looking for in LHCB are other sources of CP violation that come must come from physics beyond the standard model. Mm -hmm. So we need new sources of CP violation to be able to support the idea that that initial um, discrepancy in the, early in the early universe did come from 
CP violation. Okay, so does that we mean have that a, the, this delta quantity, we already know what the delta quantity is? We have, uh, yeah, I believe they have some calculation of it somewhere. Okay. But within the standard model, there's not enough room for CP violation to explain the universe that we see out there. Mm -hmm. So we need new sources of CP violation, and there's various mechanisms, esoteric mechanisms in, in the theory where this could come from. Obviously, the job of, C, of LHCB is to go out and find these sources, and then the theoreticians can say, oh, I think that might have come from here, or I think this might have come from here, uh -huh. and okay. then try to uh, put it all together. So one second. the So the CP violation that we've observed um, is probably strongly constrained by the uh, the dipole, what is it, the EDM, electric dipole moment of the neutron? Um, uh, uh, I haven't looked at that for a while. So, but... because Go ahead. The, the reason for one of the dark matter candidates is the axion, and that was proposed in the 1970s as a way to explain the absence of CP violation in the strong force. Like, we expected a large amount of CP violation in the strong force, and we got none or we got very, very little. Um, and so does this new result uh, point towards CP violation, some new source of CP violation that we hadn't seen before? Not that I'm aware of. I haven't linked it back yet to CP violation. Okay. Um, somebody comment in the, uh, comment in the uh, stream, CP violation. Is this an Epstein stream? I think <laughs> CP, vi CP violation does sound like you know something that someone gets up to in a in a toilet um no so cp violation is simply the differences essentially between matter and antimatter and how they behave mm -hmm. it's nothing nothing more sinister it does sound like something you get in trouble with the police for but uh nothing nothing too sinister okay uh, so tell me all right so let's now turn to what is the result that came out um yes from lhcb so the, so the result that came out I'll, I'll just go back to slightly again. So we were having decays of beauty quarks, essentially these beauty quarks, which are inside these B plus mesons. And what was observed is that when these B plus mesons were decaying, they were decaying more often to pairs of electrons than they were to pairs of muons or the or vice versa. I forget which way up it was. But the point is in the standard model, because W bosons couple equally strongly to electrons mm -hmm. and muons, a concept we call lepton universality. So essentially the standard model treats all of the leptons, the electron, the muon, and the tau the same in terms of the fundamental forces. Because we expect that, we expected to see the same amounts of decays of these V mesons mm -hmm. to um, electrons and muons. And that's not what we observe. So these results seem to suggest at least at the three sigma level that there's a breakdown of lepton universality and these mesons and beauty quarks are preferring to decay to muons over electrons which is or, or electrons over muons i forget which way up it was but there's a discrepancy between the two and that's not something we should see in the standard model uh -huh. now does that imply that it's actually an issue with the B quark, or does it imply that it's an actually an issue with the W, that the W actually has a preference in how it decays? Uh, I don't know if you could separate out the two because it's the it's the interaction. So I think you would just say the the interaction seems to have a a favoring for one or the other. The one of the things that they've suggested that could get over this is a lepto quark, which is a a mixture essentially between a quark and a lepton, which I'm not at all familiar with and haven't done much research into. Um, but essentially, the, the, the idea would be that the force itself, so I guess the W boson, mm -hmm. is treating these leptons differently, uh -huh. which is not something we would expect. So if that were true, then um, any way to produce the W, any kind of decay, would... Uh, okay, so it has to be a decay from a, like a quark. It has to be a decay from a quark. So it wouldn't work with a decay from like a, a muon or something like that. Well, so what, what happens in this decay, you, you can imagine, I don't know if you've got a, an image you can bring up, but you can imagine the B couples to a W and, you know, changes to some other type of quark. And then the W is spat out 
and then the W couples to, you know, a pair of uh, a, a pair of electrons or a pair of muons. I don't know if you've got the the Feynman diagram. Uh, I can it. I can draw it. I'm pulling up a drawing pad so that I can um, yeah. draw one. Okay, so uh, this so if it is a property of just the W particle um, instead of a property of the quarks themselves, then then you could get the same result if you just produced a bunch of top quarks or uh, not top quarks but um, tau. Well, so you, you would expect if there's a violation of lepton universality that it should show up in other instances, right? And there's there's other experiments and there's other um, measurements that have been made over the last sort of few years at LHCb and other other experiments around the world that have all got these sort of one sigma two sigma two and a half sigma values uh -huh. that might point at lepton non-universality okay but so let me let me draw the, the Feynman diagram that you described yeah, so you yeah. said that uh, you come in with a B so I can I can send you I can send you the the link with the thing and then well. it goes I can show it. what does the B decay into so you can imagine the B comes in so here it's got a, a B bar so uh, you know an anti B okay and then the double there's a there's a loop so maybe I maybe I should send you the it's essentially a loop diagram so oh, I need to I might have to send you the uh, the uh, the link here so you can have a quick a quick look so if you have a look on there you can see the, all right let me pull that up and if you, you can pull that up and we can discuss it uh okay hold on that that failed let's try one more time did you get that i got the link so i'm pulling it up so the b essentially decays to another type of quark spitting out the w and then that quark throws off uh, a photon or a or a Z boson. All right, what page is that, it on? Uh, it is on page. Oh, right one. there, page, page one. Okay, so uh, you you B bar, you get this. Oh, so it's a Z particle. Yeah. And it's so the, it can it's be the Z or the photon that decays to a two leptons. All right. So, and then, what's this LQ? Oh, that's so the lepton quark. Okay, is that's the lepton quark. quark. The potential explanation for how this happens. So you have the the the. All right, B so you have a, a B plus in. going into a K plus, and then you have this B bar that decays in this loop to up charm or. Top. Well, so it, it so it doesn't decay, but it just spits out. Right. It. it Okay. Yeah. The loop—it's a bunch of virtual particles, right? So yeah, uh, it's a bunch of virtual particles. So don't don't worry about too much about uh -huh. what's going on inside. But then it's the Z. It's the Z particle that actually decays. And then the and then the the gamma or the or the Z uh, or the Z zero decays to the two leptons. Okay. And the point is, in this in this interaction, it should the L plus L minus at the end should be equally likely to be electrons a pair of electrons so a positron and an electron or a muon and an anti-muon and we don't see the same rates for both of them when we correct for kinematic effects and that that's where the, the problem was coming in these results mm -hmm. because in terms of the fundamental interactions that are going on they're you know weak interactions and then here's a you know an em interaction or another weak interaction mm -hmm. they they should treat the leptons the same and okay so the this, the z particle should decay into um as long as it has enough energy it should decay equally into uh muon anti-muon electron positron or tau anti-tau correct. correct um and the fact that it doesn't implies either something is going on weird with the z which is uh this theory suggests would be unlikely uh and instead or maybe that it would be even if it was we would interpret it as um so another way to conceive of this would be that we interpret the z interaction is the component of the interaction that always works and that there's some other force that's going on here some other particle in here that um couples more strongly to 
muons or electrons than it does to the, the counterparts. Yeah. So the in this case, the figure on the right, that decay favors one type of, or this process favors one type of decay or one type of byproduct more than yeah. another, and that's where the asymmetry arises. Correct. So the one on the right is an attempt to, is a hypothesis about how this problem could be answered. So the left is the standard model um, interaction, what we would expect to happen. And then the little diagram on the right there with the LQ, the leptoquark, is a potential diagram that could interfere, be an additional way for this interaction that could, could uh, how it could proceed, that could lead to the discrepancy that we see in the results. Mm -hmm. So what I wonder, so the implications, if there was a leptoquark, uh, the implications would actually have probably significant uh, effects in the very early universe when all these things are happening. Um, okay, interesting. So the, that's the, so the result was they saw this asymmetry um, and now we need to do two things. One is come up with possible explanations that might have other observable consequences um, and take more data so that we can determine if it's a, a statistical anomaly or if it's a real, if it's the real thing. Yeah, exactly. So, so a lot of these measurements, as I was saying, there have been various measurements over the last sort of few years that seem to point at, you know, little discrepancies in, in lepton um, universality. But they, they always seem to be about, about the, you know, the one, two sigma, and they don't really go anywhere or they appear in the data and then they disappear. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, the first one, as far as I know, that's sort of around that three sigma level plus. Um, so people were getting a little bit excited about it, particularly as it shows a pattern with other results. So people were sort of... Yeah, okay, so they, it's not they, the only hint that we have. It's not the only hint, but so people were getting this, you know, cautiously excited phrase out in, uh -huh. in, in sort of, you know, Cerny Twitter. Yeah, okay, um, now uh, one quick thing. So a uh, question came up that's like, what's a virtual particle? So when you have a Feynman diagram, like the ones that are I'm showing, uh, the particles that end where like you can see the end of the line so this the up quark the bottom the b minus or the b bar quark uh, those are real particles those are particles that you produce that can appear in a detector um, anything that has where it doesn't terminate where the the line that indicates the presence of the particle doesn't end but is actually connected to the rest of the diagram those are virtual particles so virtual particles are particles that exist only within the interaction um, and the real particles are the ones that can basically in the diagram can go off to infinity. Yeah. So, so the real particles, if, if that's the right word, the real particles are the ones that you see going into and coming out of the interaction. And then the vertical, the, virtu the virtual particles, excuse me, are, are essentially the mechanism inside. You never mm -hmm. see them. You couldn't, you couldn't catch them. You couldn't, you couldn't use them. Mm -hmm. um, and as a consequence, they... they, as a consequence, the virtual particles can have unique quantum. So quantum mechanics allows virtual particles to behave somewhat differently than, um, than real particles in that they can appear to violate certain rules of quantum mechanics, um, like what their mass is, for example, but because they ne never make it outside of the box of the interaction, you never actually see it. They never change any real physics quote unquote yeah they don't change anything that you observe from the outside so it's a little bit of a black magic box inside the interaction yeah so um the follow-up question was why do, why differentiate virtual particles if you can't detect them and that's precisely the reason that you can't detect them and so um real particles are particles that you actually can detect and that you can actually produce and virtual particles are the ones that you can't detect um, and as a consequence um there are fewer constraints placed upon their behavior. Yeah, so this... Uh, oh, and, you know, okay, this... and then another question that came up is then, what's it, the difference it... between these virtual particles and the, and the leptoquark? And the answer is that uh, we've seen, like, Z particles. We've seen a lot of the particles that are in these loops. Um, the ones that are virtual in this particular interaction, we know what their properties are. And so... The problem is that the observations that were being seen in this experiment uh, disagree with what our understanding of these particles are, and as a consequence, we need to invoke some new particle in the interaction that would 
make the change or like affect the change that we observe. So this this result was, you know, it was all the rage about a week ago, uh -huh. um, and then it just sort of fell off the map because. <clears throat> You know, a few reasons, one of them being the three sigma level. So, you know, a lot of particle physicists don't get out of bed for, you know, less than four sigma. Yeah, all, all um, the astronomers would be like, um, you know, raving about this and astronomy Twitter would be all over the place with a three my, sigma detection. My, uh, my biology friend was telling me about his like amazing, you know, P values of less than 5%. And I was like, just, you know, don't, please don't talk to me about this. <laughs> two sigma things um there could be just anything uh -huh. um but yeah a lot of particle physicists you know not particularly interested down at the three sigma level there was a little bit of you know sort of hubbub about it in the media um but not not too much mm -hmm. and then as yeah I now say, part, uh, so part of the reason i guess for the audience that three sigma doesn't get like doesn't really excite particle physicists or high energy physicists is because they see bazillions I think is the right term of collisions and so as a consequence there are many even though something is maybe only one out of a thousand like the probability of something happening is only one out of a thousand when you're running bazillions of uh, measurements um, those one out of a thousand things can happen with um, uncomfortable frequency yeah when and you're so running thousands and thousands of measurements they, they come up more often than you'd than you'd expect. There was there was, there was a, a link on the on the blog, the Quantum Diaries, just saying like, look, here are this year's you know three sigma effects that have come and gone, uh -huh. because it's it's a very common thing that you know these three sigma variations arise, and then we take a little bit more data and they go away because they were just fluctuations in the data. So when we're at three sigma, you know people start to get interested, the interest starts to go up, but nobody's really biting yet. Uh -huh. Is when you start to get sort of four sigma. And above four sigma, getting towards that holy grail of five, that people really start to take interest, as we'll come on to with the mm -hmm. the uh, the G minus two results. Okay, so this is a good time to pivot then, from unless right. there's more to say about the um, this lepto core. But it, it would oh, be. I, I, I think the thing with this is we're just going to have to wait, aren't we? Because the, it's a three sigma result. There's going to need to be a lot more data taken. LHCb is not going to run again until next year, so you're probably not going to have any follow-up on this for you know at least a year and a half two years now does that mean um, is it not going to run again simply because the lhc is going through an upgrade the LHC's not running okay right the lhc is not running now as far as i'm aware and then it and then it will come back online next year are, are they with, doing an upgrade is that what's going on an upgrade lhcb upgrade yeah will be will be online so be able to take more data now how long it will take them to turn around the analysis you know i, I don't know because i'm not close enough to that analysis to know but I imagine if it's not running until next year, it's going to be the middle of next year at the very earliest. Mm -hmm. So a year at the very, very earliest before we find out anything more about this. And given it's three sigma, I think most people are just like, let's wait and see. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> even then, we would need independent verification. Uh -huh. um, so what else so, could do this? Is there another B factory somewhere that can do this? There's the one that is, I is there one in Italy? Now, over in Tokai, is it? Um, there's uh oh bell two right bell two could probably do it uh, and where's that so, is that uh it is over at i always forget where bell two is is that the one that's over in japan i think bell two bell two is a uh, super b factory for precision measurements which is over at uh where is it now uh japan uh, uh, sukuba Tsukuba Ibaraki. Okay, so it's over in Japan. So they probably would be able to do this, Okay, I imagine. Um, so we need the independent verification. We need more data as it is. So it's going to be a little bit of a wait on this, which is why I think people have pivoted pretty hard uh -huh. to, the, uh, to the G minus two results. Because, listen, in, in particle physics, it's been a... A slightly lean period, right? You've had people saying it's the death of particle physics. There's nothing that we're going to find, you know, in the in the years upcoming in particle physics. Is there any reason to have a new, you know, larger LHC, given that we, you know, didn't find all the supersymmetric particles we thought we were going to find at the at the sort of the energies we were working with? You know, people have been talking down particle physics. Um, it's been a little bit of a lean period. So anything that comes along that suggests new physics. 
is something that gets particle physicists very sort of excited. So they were excited about this last week. And as I say, a lot more excited about the uh, the G minus two results with them being up at four four point two sigma now. So uh -huh. 